Today's episode is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Friends, have you ever had the urge to watch the insane video for My Camera Never Lies by the obscure 80s band Bucks Fizz, only to find out that you can't because it's blocked in the United States? I think we've all been there. Fortunately, that's why I use ExpressVPN, which not only hides my IP address from whatever prying eyes might be all up in my biz, but also lets me watch all the videos that YouTube has blocked, because by God, it's my right to watch whatever I want. That's more like it, because if you can't watch Bucks Fizz, how else are you being discriminated against? What are these foreign countries hiding from us? What are they watching on their Netflix that we can't watch on ours? Well, get on ExpressVPN and set it to the UK, and you could be binging American Idol, America's Got Talent, and all sorts of other shows they've got hidden and stashed over there. Who knows? Well, if you want to know, get ExpressVPN. Find out how you can get three months free by clicking the link in the description box. All right, all right. And now, on with the show. And now, for our feature presentation. I get a lot of requests for train records. I'm going to do my best to get all of them eventually, but there is one request I have gotten more than any for this show. One whose disastrous reception still lives in notoriety 17 years later. And that is, of course, Liz Fair by Liz Fair, her reputation-destroying fourth album from 2003. What happened to Liz Fair? Well, Liz Fair changed. Why can't I a little weird if you think about it. Train Records is a show about infamous bombs. I don't usually get requests for an artist's highest charting record that produced their biggest hits. Maybe you had to be there. I was, and trust me, I have rarely seen an album get such a violently negative reaction. Before this record, Liz Fair had been an indie darling. Her debut album, Exile and Guyville, was one of the most acclaimed records of the 90s, with its blunt confessional lyrics and unpolished vocals. Through the 90s, she was an indie rock goddess, even if she never had much chart success. She felt like someone you could know personally by listening to her music. The critics just adored her. And it seemed like she threw out everything distinctive about herself on that fourth album, which was made by hit-making super producers The Matrix, the same people who had built giant smash hits for the likes of Jason Mraz and Avril Lavigne. To put that in modern terms, it'd be kind of like if the next Mitski album was produced by Marshmello. A lot of the indie kids were like, what happened? She really changed. She really, really did. This new album is like the antithesis of everything we knew about Liz. Whatever chart success that record had was completely overshadowed by cries of betrayal from the longtime fans. Pitchfork gave it a rare 0.0 score. To this day, it's remembered as one of the most disastrous attempts at selling out in rock history. Honestly, I think that album's pretty decent, and the backlash always seemed really overblown and kind of ridiculous to me. So no, I'm not covering it for this show. But if I wanted to, I certainly could. The spectacle of alt-rock royalty turning teen pop at age 36 was deeply alienating to all her old fans, and she never really won them back. It's not like she made a whole bunch of new fans either, she didn't become the next Nelly Furtado or anything. She got one radio hit out of it, and the second song, they got a few plays here and there. She made it to number 27 on the album charts. That's a pretty paltry take, considering all she sacrificed to get there. You can very justifiably say that this record ruined her career. Really and if I wanted to, I could also easily cover her next album, 2005 Somebody's Miracle, which shifted to a more mature sound and earned neither cred nor hits. It was her worst-selling LP and was swiftly forgotten by everyone, confirming the end of her relevance in any sphere of music. But we're not looking at either of those. Instead, I want to take you five years later, to July 4th weekend, 2010. The third Twilight movie hits theaters, Joey Chestnut wins his fourth consecutive hot dog eating championship, and indie legend Liz Fair, with no buildup whatsoever, suddenly puts up her entire next album fun style on what can only barely be called her website for a mere $5.99. Accompanying the album was the following message from Liz, which reads, You were never supposed to hear these songs. These songs lost me my management, my record deal, and a lot of nights of sleep. Yes, I wrapped one of them. Yes, I wrapped one of them. I'm as surprised as you are. But here's the thing you need to know about these songs and the ones coming next. These are all me. 
love them or hate them, but don't mistake them for anything other than entirely personal, untethered from the machine, free for all view of the world, refracted through my own crazy lens. Well, that's what you wanted, right? All you critics calling her a sellout? No more polished mainstream pop. Here is the pure, uncommercialized Liz Fair that you wanted. Here is her management losing, record deal ending, completely uncompromised vision, fun style. I was tripping looking at my portfolio, wonder how I was gonna make enough dough, you know. Yep, that's her rapping, all right. Holy fuck. This is train records. <laughs> It's kind of rock, pop, folk, feminism. Rap. In 2010, even with no record label or management, Liz Fair still had enough clout that a new record would get a decent amount of attention. And at the time, releasing an album online was kind of a power move. Radiohead had done it, Nine Inch Nails had done it. It was basically them saying that they'd built such a devoted, reliable following that they didn't even need the machinery of the label promoting them anymore. So a lot of people were actually pretty interested in this bold new move by Liz Fair. And since that wasn't that long ago, you can still find those old blogs and clock people's instant responses. And yeah, the response was pretty overwhelming. What the fucking fuck? They were reacting to the first single, Bollywood, which was downloadable for free, so let's say I dispense with the build-up and just play it for you now. Here we are. Here is how people were introduced to the new Liz Fair album. <laughs> Been looking at my portfolio, wonder how I was gonna make enough dough, you know. Caught up a friend who wrote for One Tree Hill in Jericho. He had a job on me, I check it with the four letter company. Get it up. Get it up. Uh... I reached my representative who pulled out the contract from the file cabinet. Oh, okay, so this is her rapping about her record contract over some kind of Bollywood bongra beat? Tell you how it's done here in the Hollywood Maybe you was thinking you was in the Bollywood Holy God, what does she think she's doing? Listen here, my dear little Rone Don't you give me the phone name below name Yeah, I read all those initial responses and more than one commenter was reminded of Madonna's American Life rap. I'm drinking a soy latte, I get a double shot. it goes through my body and I have no idea how people still even remember that disaster, but I guess there was just nothing else to compare it to. Oh, that was Liz, we see you as a commodity. She's 20 years older, still hot, but getting a lot colder. This is clearly ironic, but that doesn't make it better. Arguably, it makes it worse. A lot of people speculated that it was a parody of M.I.A. The album even had computer vomit cover art like M.I.A. had had on her last album. I'll, I'll just say it, if Liz releases today, it would probably get her canceled. Like, there's just something about a 40-something white mom who thinks that rapping badly is the height of hilarity that's just beyond all scope of good taste. Also, what the fuck is she even rapping about? To proposition for ya, how about you let me keep my profits as a scorer? Record says a shrink and I'm getting poorer. I got okay, so I guess you need to know what was going on in Liz Fair's life before this record. Somebody's Miracle flopped in 2005, she got dropped from her label, and needing cash, she turned to scoring and composing. Again, like Radiohead and Nine Inch Nails. But in her case, not for like big artsy prestige movies. Yeah, she was making background music for crappy TV shows you've never heard of, like Swingtown or... I, I, don't, I don't know what this is. I mean, it was kind of a surprising move. I'd always thought of her more of a songwriter than a composer, but she actually did that for a while. Uh, it seems to have gone pretty well for her. And, um... You know, now that I say all this out loud, I realize it's actually not very interesting. I can't imagine why you care. But Bollywood kind of assumes that you do. I mean, her time as a TV composer is very important to this album. That's what fun style comes from. Apparently, when you're locked in a studio trying to write a billion snippets of background music for some stupid CW show, you go a little nuts. So her and her writing partner would get stupid and make goofy tracks like this. Recording fun style is what they used to call these goof-off sessions. And all I can say is, I'm sure it was fun for you, Liz. But what use could this have for someone who isn't her? Even her mega fans can't have been this invested in the ins and outs of her contract. Okay, so that was horrendous. And I know what you're asking. 
Is that the entire album? Are there any actual songs in this album, or is it all like that? Okay, don't worry, no, it's mostly normal songs. Bollywood is not really a representative track. It's not like the whole album sounds like that. But way too much of the album does sound like that. A few months after she dropped the album on her website, she actually did get an actual, very small record label to put it out on a physical disc. Didn't do anything to turn the album's reception around, but, you know, at least it had real cover art now. They also packaged it with a bonus disc of early demos, which is probably what most people bought it for. But hey, now you had a whole new album full of new Liz Fair music, might as well check that out too. So, you pop it in the old stereo system, you hit play, and this is the first thing you hear. Okay, well that's new. I mean, I guess it's kind of like a Tori Amos thing she's got. Liz, what's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? It's my little voice of self-doubt. Okay, more funny voices. Well, this ATO will never put this out. You won't be washing dishes in this town. It's career suicide. More shit about her career? Really? Okay, yeah, this is also going way off the rails. You know what, why don't we do some more background? After her fifth album flopped, Liz Fair left Capitol Records, and in 2008 she signed with a fairly big indie label, ATO Records. That's Dave Matthews' label, Dave plays guitar on a few songs on the album, but it didn't work out there either, hence her having put out the album alone. Pitchfork, in yet another and an increasing string of negative reviews, speculated that this was all intentional. It must be some kind of self-sabotaging troll album like Bob Dylan's Self-Portrait or Eminem's Encore. Just a giant fuck you to the critics, the label, the over-demanding fans, everybody. Because after all, these songs are, quote, horrible on just about every conceivable level, and there's no way Fair can't know it. Here's the thing though, she honestly didn't know it. Not at first at least. When she first turned in Bollywood to her bosses, she thought they'd eat this up. I, I don't know what I expected, like maybe they'd be like, haha, that was cool, that's neat, or I think what I hoped was that they'd be like, you're onto something, this is a totally new art form, you know? Really? This? And they were icy. They were just absolutely appalled. I think in retrospect, there may have been some part of their business that was tied up in the business that I was slamming. Right, right, in the lyrics. There may have been some, like, monetary interest that was threatened. No, I think they genuinely didn't like it, Liz. It wasn't they were scared of pissing off whoever that song is about. It's just actually really bad. But instead of reversing course, she doubled down on it and just kept making more of these until she lost her contract and her agent. She stuck to her guns. It's kind of admirable, I guess, but also insane. Okay, well, after you've gotten through those first fun-style two tracks, you'll get to your first normal song. In fact, the solid majority of the album is normal songs. But I'll be honest, I had to listen to this album five times before I even noticed them. Here's one of the better songs, Satisfied. It's, you know, it's, it's a warm, friendly, amiable track. It's all right. <laughs> Look, okay, let's go back to the 03 album. But this is just the beginning. We're already wet and we're gonna go swimming. Liz Fair, self-titled, is fine. It's a perfectly acceptable pop rock record. In a lot of parts, it's actually pretty good. At the time, there was a growing critical movement called Poptimism. Oh. That would quickly overwhelm the discourse. Critics started becoming more receptive of pop. If this album had come out even just a year later, the backlash probably wouldn't have been so bad. These days, liking that album isn't even controversial anymore. Liz, for what it's worth, stands by it, but she must have been burnt by the response because she seemed really unsure of her direction ever since. The following album, Somebody's Miracle, she called that one a fucking compromised disaster, which it is. And I hate to say it, but that's what the unfun style tracks on Fun Style sound like to me. It doesn't have the raw lyrics and music of her debut. It doesn't have the catchy pop gloss of the self-titled. I can't really tell you why they exist. She seems way more interested in the goof tracks. There are four Fun Style tracks on Fun Style. That's out of 11 songs, so less than half. But more than a third. They just overwhelm the rest of the album. Like here's one of the few songs from that album she seems to have performed live. It's one of the normal ones, Oh Bangladesh. Oh, Bangladesh. Which, 
considering her take on Bollywood, maybe leave Bangladesh alone. But it's not like that. It's just another not quite finished sounding rock song. I guess it's about sex. It's there. It's all right. You are just absolutely not going to remember it though, not compared to Beat Is Up. The trick to happiness is to ignore anything negative you might feel about yourself. That people don't really like you that much. Man, Liz, what did India do to you? I like to get my copy with all the little frothy things on the side. And I like to put in those little sticks. The trick to freedom. Okay, Beat Is Up is a track where you hear an Indian guru dispensing garbage new age self-help advice. And in between, Liz does an impression of a brainless Midwestern mom who presumably listens to this crap. People like positive people. Positivity makes good things happen. My husband doesn't let me buy those tabloid magazines because he says that it makes me fight with him more. I understand that this is a satire and I get what it's making fun of. I just don't really get why? It's not really good music, and as far as comedy material goes, it's really worn out. I don't see what sport there is in it. I don't want them growing up thinking that everything's just going to be handed to them. They're going to have to work their asses off, just like I did. It, what's the point of this bit? Is, is this someone you know, Liz? A family member you don't like? Take that, Deidre. It goes without saying that this didn't get any radio play or anything since it was released with no label. However, there is one music video for it. Bizarrely, it was released in 2012, two years after the album came out. That's an extremely strange delay, but you know, fine, whatever. The video was for the song Andy Slater. Okay, I'll bite. Who's Andy Slater? Andy Slater was the head of Capitol Records when she was there. Okay, uh, apparently they didn't really get along. He was the one that forced those skimpy photo shoots on her. He refused to release videos unless she did things his way. Boy, he sounds like a real dick. But I mean, I, I had to look all that up. Is anyone gonna get this? Okay, there's the video. I think that's supposed to be Andy. You know, Bollywood was about how she needed money, but there's no way a record label paid for this video, right? No one drops money like this to promote a two-year-old dead record. I think she produced this herself just to reenact this revenge fantasy. Which, uh, which, it's not like anyone saw this, so I don't know how burnt Andy was about it. As for the song itself... Look, as early as 1998, people had started complaining that Liz Fair was becoming the poor man's Sheryl Crow. Well... Yeah, it's basically just a weaker Sheryl Crow single. She's an indie rocker. This type of ass-kicker rock and roller isn't really her wheelhouse. She's never had that kind of voice or conviction. Meh. Oh, if you miss how we were in September and Like, there are songs on here I think are pretty nice. Because I'm me, I gravitated toward the popular songs, like Miss September and Satisfied. Happy too. And I like these songs well enough, but I wouldn't buy a CD for them, or even bother to illegally download them. Well, that's the album. And we've got one fun style song left, so let's check out the album closer. You hate it. Oh boy, I bet I do. Hey, so I got the new Liz track. Have you heard it? Did you like it? No, I hate it. You, you hated it. I hate it. You, yeah, I hated it, huh? I, uh, I hated it. Jesus Christ, it's yet another song about her struggles to get the album released and these record labels who just don't appreciate her. Oh. We don't agree on it. Uh oh, I totally love it. Uh oh, I think I'm a genius. Uh oh, you're being a penis. Colada, that is. You're being a penis. Colada, that is.
Okay, ignoring penis colada, here's just a flat, neutral description of the entire song. Two record executives talk about how much they hate Liz Fair's new material. You know, I listened to it twice. The second time was worse. On so the scale of one to They do this for nearly three minutes. And then we hear Liz giving an acceptance speech at some award show. Oh my god! Oh my god! I, I want to thank HTO and who am I forgetting? Who am I forgetting? Oh, Chuck Todd and Dave Matthews! Dave Matthews is the best! And after that, we hear the record executives now congratulating themselves for Liz's success and taking all the credit. The demographic that we chose, I think, had a lot to do with it. You know, I don't want to blow my own bugle, but uh, I, I knew this was coming. I liked it a lot. This song is delusional. It's her imagining that all those higher-ups that didn't get her vision are just going to be eating shit when everyone gets to hear the record and sees how great it is. It'll be the new Yankee Hotel Foxtrot. You empty suits just don't get it. No, Liz! Penis Colada is not gonna win you a Grammy! The sad thing is that of the four fun style tracks, You Hate It is the one that's the closest to good. I actually like some of the musical ideas here. It's got that genre mix and match, sarcastic Frank Zappa energy to it. I could maybe talk myself into liking it if it were about anything else. Like, you can make a case for this. Like, this album is kind of daring, right? She said she had entirely intended to just throw everything out and make Exile and Guyville 2 like the suits wanted, and then she just couldn't bring herself to do it. She had to release the album that she believed in. I respect that. Other people have defended Fun Style, specifically for the comedy skit tracks. I do grant that those songs are certainly more enthusiastic than anything else she'd done in a while. Maybe it's just Stockholm Syndrome, but... Yeah, after some 20 listens, the album's wackadoo energy did start to grow on me a little. The problem isn't that this record is silly or weird or not like the old Liz. The problem is that showbiz satires are the last refuge of the creatively spent. Way too much of the time, they come from people who've used up all their ideas except for the things right in front of their noses, and it just devolves into a tedious display of score settling and inside jokes that no one can relate to. It's an exercise for people who've been in the industry too long and need to take a long step away. Liz, my love, get out of the business. Well, she kind of did. In that big note to the fans, she promised to keep sending postcards, but she hasn't released a record since. As far back as 2012, she said she was working on a new album. It was tentatively scheduled for release last summer, but then the world descended into chaos, and now it's looking more like next year. I guess we'll see. And you know, this is a show about career enders, her last album came out 10 years ago, and her last good album much earlier than that. That's more than long enough to call time on Liz Fair as an artist. And yet, I would not at all be surprised if she had a late career comeback. Liz Fair commands even more respect now than she ever did. Rolling Stone just released that updated greatest albums of all time list. Exile and Guyville ranked higher than Led Zeppelin 4. She's very much an inspiration to a ton of girls who came after, and while everyone remembers the backlash to her pop album, that backlash has aged much worse than the record did. Ten years is a long time to be working on an album, and everything about her last couple decades suggests a struggle for inspiration. But who knows? Maybe the long break has recharged her and given her some perspective. If you notice, another chick rock veteran of the 90s just released her first album in almost a decade, and everyone went nuts over it. Fetch the bolt cutters. So maybe Liz has her own Fetch the Bolt Cutters brewing. In her memoir from last year, she writes that after Prince died, she started thinking about shoring up her own legacy and leaving things on a good note. I hope she does. Because right now, her final postcard to the world is a late-period Kanye-style shitpost that felt like a giant middle finger. Call this one Exile from Tasteville. Let's go now.